Hello everyone. So I'm going to continue my um, talk about uh, responsible government and the UK Constitution. Um, John Alder, the legal scholar, notably said that accountability of government is a necessary and basic characteristic of any democracy. The United Kingdom, of course, considers itself a democracy. So there's the central executive, and that's obviously based in London, Whitehall, as we often know it as uh, that synecdoche, Whitehall being a street that connects Parliament to Trafalgar Square. And there you'll find, uh, just off Whitehall, we find number 10 Downing Street, the Prime Minister's official residence. Notice that in some official documents, we referred to as First Lord of the Treasury, as that's one of his titles. There's the Cabinet, and so there are roughly 25 Cabinet Ministers. The Prime Minister's one of them. He chairs the Cabinet, and each Cabinet Minister has about three junior Ministers responsible for him, responsible to him, and each junior Minister is responsible for a different area of, of governance. So most Cabinet Ministers have the title Secretary of State for whatever. Secretary of State for Transport, Secretary of State for Health, but that's a bit of a mouthful, so we often say Transport Secretary, Health Secretary, and so on. So below, let's say, the um, uh, Secretary of State for Education, there'll be three Ministers of State, so like Minister of State for Primary Schools, Ministry of State for Second, Minister of State for Secondary Schools, and Minister of State for Universities, or something like that. Like there's a Foreign and Commonwealth Secretary, for short, we often just say Foreign Secretary. And then below him will be like the Minister of State for Africa, the Minister of State for Europe, the Minister of State for Latin America, or something like that. But Minister of State is a bit long, so we just might say Europe Minister or Minister for Africa, and so on. Of course, along Whitehall are lots of the, the, these, these government ministries, but they mostly contain civil servants, not politicians. So civil servants who, after leaving school or university, sit exams, get into the civil service, and they're doing the paperwork, organising things, well, on computers mostly, not really meant to be making decisions, but implementing them, providing advice, and so on, uh, planning things, they're supposed to be neutral, and to carry out government instructions to the best of their ability, uh, anonymous, usually not named, only the very senior ones, um, uh, and that uh, acting disinterestedly in the, in, for, for, for the benefit of the public, so um, not to be politicised, not to be partisan, helping Labour or harming the Conservatives or vice versa. Um, so it should be a promotion on the basis of ability and not on the basis of, of, of favouritism. Um, you may have seen Yes Minister all about this, but uh, people complained under Tony Blair, has been increasingly politicised, special advisers, as in their political appointees, were introduced under Margaret Thatcher, and they increased hugely under Blair, he tripled the number of them, and they were allowed to give instructions to civil servants. Um, Anyway, there are various executive agencies and next steps agencies. And how accountable are they? That's debatable. So uh, Parliament is, is, is scrutinised as the executive, and indeed backbench members of Parliament, the governing party, they can scrutinise it too. They might be hostile to a particular government policy. So they ask questions, there are debates, there, there are um, special committees on different areas of government activity, and obviously they can vote on legislation. Ultimately, they could bring the government down with a vote of no confidence. This very seldom happened. There was talk of doing that in uh, September um, 2019, but that wasn't attempted in the end. So there are oral questions, standing up and asking them, the Prime Minister or um, any other government minister, in, in both the Commons and the Lords. There are also written answers, and there are civil, uh, civil written questions, and the civil servant had to try and find out the information and get back to you in a certain period of time. But if some information would be too time-consuming or, or expensive to, to find out, they, are, they have the right to say, well, we're just not going to do that. Um, so you can look at Hansard, the official record of what's said in Parliament, that book. Um, so we know there are bills, each bill goes through three readings in the House of Commons and House of Lords. There are extensive debates, especially at the second reading. There can be an emergency debate on a, a crucial issue, which has come up at very short notice, like whether to take military action against Syria, for instance opposition day debates when the opposition is allowed to propose the motion and their daily adjournment debates backbenchers the early day motions as well so backbenchers sometimes get to propose what's to be debated um, so backbenchers obviously is a member of parliament from a governing party or opposition party but the point is he or she is not a cabinet minister nor indeed the shadow cabinet at the moment obviously the conservative party forms the government so there are the cabinet ministers on the bench opposite is the labor party and they have their shadow cabinet. So the leader of the Labour Party, he's chatting the Prime Minister, 
Sir Keir Starmer has sort of become Prime Minister, so he's particularly looking at what the Prime Minister's doing and criticising the Prime Minister where Starmer thinks that Johnson's got it wrong. And if you're um, Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer, you're looking at what the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak, is doing, and you're exposing any mistakes by him, and you're preparing yourself to become Chancellor of the Exchequer should Labour win the next election. The same goes for the whole of the Shadow Cabinet. Obviously, smaller parties like the Liberal Democrats and the SNP, they have their shadow cabinet, as it were. Trouble is, the SNP is not trying to take office at a UK level, and um, the, the, the Liberal Democrats have only got 11 MPs, so not enough to form a full shadow cabinet. Anyway, so, so legis legislation is scrutinised. So how much does, does Parliament actually scrut scrutinise it? There's delegated legislation, that's roughly 3,000 statutory instruments per year, allowing local councils or various authorities or even secretaries of state to come up with more legislation. Um, so perhaps we've got a negative resolution procedure, and perhaps too much, is a, uh, too much authority is given to uh, various executives to just make law like that. It's been, um, it, they've been granted authority by Parliament. So there was the EU Withdrawal Act in 2018, and people were worried about the so-called Henry VIII clauses, which they felt gave the uh, government too much sweeping power. There are public committees, which obviously the public can go in and sit and watch to scrutinise bills, and the membership is, is meant to be roughly in proportion to the strength of the various parties in the House of Commons. And incidentally, there is open government, so you have the right to go for free and sit in the, 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 the gallery of the House of Commons House of Lords to watch the proceedings. They're televised. The Lords was televised in the 80s. Parliament resisted that until 1989. And even sound recording they finally came in the early 80s, and that was contra controversial too. OK, so how about select committees? These are based on each department, and they uh, take evidence. They call in experts to, to speak to them, and they report on major topical issues. They look into Iraq, should they have fought or not, or about the media. Um, so there are special committees, like a liaison one, public accounts committee, as in on spending, the human rights committee, and so forth. So um, how effective are these committees? Well, the good thing is they can send for people, for papers, for other information. They're very well informed. Uh, they ask witnesses to, to, to testify before them, and there's a lot of media interest in what's going on. And they bring a great deal of expertise to the job. They elect the chair of the committee, the man or woman from a governing party or an opposition party, to be in charge of it. Well, what are the deficiencies of the current system? Well, perhaps they're too small. Um, perhaps the minor parties don't get on them enough and it's, it's dubious whether they actually affect the government's program. So let's look at ministerial responsibility. This is a convention. They're accountable and they have to give an account to Parliament and say what they're doing. And if you lie to Parliament or mislead Parliament, that's it, you've lost your job. But don't they mislead it quite a lot and get away with it through circumlocution? Um, so they'd often try and sidestep the question. So they're meant to be responsible to Parliament ministers, um, but are they actually required to resign? Uh, very few of them have resigned when they should have resigned. Often they're pressured for months and months when they've really screwed up and that they, they don't resign. So how accountable are they? There are various mechanisms, um, uh, questions to ministers, prime ministers question time every Wednesday, which is a bit of a theatrical knockabout. There are debates. Uh, ministers have to give evidence to select committees if it's their area of responsibility. They are obliged to reform the House. Scott report in 1996 about selling weapons to Iraq in the in the 1980s said that the ministers are obliged to inform the House of relevant matters, and it criticised William Waldegrave for doing that. Now he was a Conservative MP, cabinet minister, um, and then he was ennobled as Lord Waldegrave um, of North Hill, but uh, so he lost his seat in 97, and people had thought of talked about as a future prime minister. Well, the price of failure for for him was high. He's been punished. I mean, being made provost of Eton, that's his old school. Provost is like the um, the head of the Board of Governors who actually lives in. And I happen to know from Lord Butler, former head of the Civil Service, um, in the late 90s, early noughties, there were various positions that Lord Waldegrave was considered for. Um, and people said, no, we can't touch him because he's tainted, because of that whole arms to Iraq affair. Although he didn't inform Parliament, Sir Nicholas Scott, the judge who, who led the Scott, uh, wrote the Scott report, he said that Lord Waldegrave had no duplicitous intent. Don't want to go too much into the particulars of this thing in the 80s, things being sold to Iraq during the Iran-Iraq war, sanctions in Iraq, can't sell weapons, various things were sold which could be used as weapons, um, but the, the UK government was assured that it wouldn't be used for military purposes. 
Okay, coming on to responsibility. There's a responsibility to resign. That's the last stage of accountability. But you've got to bear in mind the political uh, environment. If they enjoy the confidence of the Prime Minister, they can be kept on. People like Keith Vass, who was um, uh, misused public facilities, um, a government building for the sake of a private meeting, and, and the civil service coming out defending what he was doing. Surely that was unethical. Um, so there are two main situations when ministers are required to resign, when they're personally at fault or when the department's at fault. Um, or, you know, when there's some sort of conflict of interest, like um, when the Department of Trade and Industry under Peter Madelson was uh, investigating Jeffrey um, uh, Robinson, a uh, Labour MP, and um, so, but, but, but uh, there's clearly a conflict of interest because Peter Mandelson um, was indebted hundreds of thousands of pounds there to Robinson. Can you see a blatant conflict of interest? Wouldn't his department go easy on Robinson because Mandelson would like to be able to pay back his loan slower or at a lower rate of interest? But Mandelson said, I've insulated myself for this, from this, but it wasn't, wasn't good enough. Clearly, there would be always a suspicion that he was making sure his department would go easy on Robinson for, because of his own financial interest. Okay, so they may have private moral failings, sleaze that used to be known in the 90s, and the media takes a salacious interest in this kind of thing, extramarital affairs, homosexuality, because even though after it was legalized in 1967, it was still thought to be deviant behavior. Um, we so, will shortly be uh, at adultery Quantum. is not considered to be a resigning matter anymore. A misleading parliament is the, is the issue. Jack Profumo, Minister Change for War, lied to the House to about his affair Stankless. with Christine Keeler, for example, in 1963. Um, okay, so how about trust in public office? If you're they should show here, integrity. Sure you when they accept gifts and hospitality, they can be morally you. compromised. Jonathan Aitken, Chief Secretary of the Treasury in the early 90s, didn't do this. He had to, nowadays, you have to disclose all these financial interests, all these freebies. Thank you. And for he eventually, it was a perjury case about it, eventually, him lying under oath, and he eventually went to prison for it. So, David Blunkett in 2005, fast tracking his nanny's visa, he resigned over that. Liam Fox over um, well, his trip to Sri Lanka. Anyway, that's enough for the moment about ministerial responsibility. Toodaloo.